I'm Jim Mallinson. I'm the chair of the SOAS Centre for Yoga Studies. Um, welcome, everyone. This is the uh, fourth, I think, in our sort of impromptu series of online lectures. The Centre for Yoga Studies at SOAS is a, is a hub for various different people working on and teaching um, anything that's anything to do with yoga. Um, we are going to be, hopefully, I think one of the I, mean, I hope everyone's doing okay in these difficult times. But one silver lining is, is I think, this series, and we're hoping to uh, take advantage of people's willingness. There seems to be a lot of willingness to uh, do these online lectures. So we're hoping to be able to put uh, one lecture out every fortnight. So keep an eye out for that on our Facebook or Instagram. Uh, during tonight's talk, if you'd like to ask a question, we're using slido uh the the link to that you'll find in the email that went out with your uh, registration for the event and it's a good system whereby you, you you can either put forward a question or look at the questions that have been posted and then upvote them and so we'll uh, at the end i will ask the questions in the order of their popularity uh and i just uh, inform you that the event is being recorded for our youtube channel where you can have a look at past events and future events when they go up there um, and I think that's about it for housekeeping so now it just uh, remains for me to introduce you to this evening's speaker who's Dr Karen O'Brien Cott she's the lecturer in Asian religions and ethics at the University of Roehampton where she teaches and works on classical South Asian Sanskrit texts and culture uh, meditation yoga and she, in particular, as we'll find more about this evening, she explores the interconnections of Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. She also is a, a founding member and leading light of the SOAS Center for Yoga Studies. Um, she, Karen did her PhD. I was lucky enough to be on her committee. P uh, actually, she did her PhD at SOAS. The title was The Seed and Cloud as Metaphors of Liberation in Buddhist and Patanjali Yoga, an Intertextual Study. Uh, excellent piece of work, um, really sort of made me question a few assumptions I'd made, not just about the subject, but about methodology and so forth. It was an expert piece of methodological analysis. Um, she's also the author of various articles and encyclopedia entries. Uh, there's one article which was published last week in the Journal of Indian Philosophy, which is closely related to this evening's talk. Uh, and perhaps most significantly we're forthcoming together with Suzanne Newcomb. She's edited the Routledge Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies. And so tonight, this evening, she's going to be talking to us about Patanjali Yoga, Yoga Chara and Dharma Mega, which means the, the cloud of the Dharma, but it's a bit more complicated than that, as I think we will probably find out. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen O'Brien Cobb. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and thank you to the Centre of Yoga Studies for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I think it's really great to have the opportunity to take research out to wider audiences. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about 40-45 minutes. Um, please do uh, write to your questions, add them to Slido because there will be some time for discussion and questions at the end. And um, as Jim said, the talk that I'm giving today is part of my PhD. Um, I gave this talk in an earlier form at Sanskrit Tradition in the Modern World at the University of Manchester in 2018. And um, much of what I say this evening will be based on an article that's just been pre-published in e-format in the Journal of Indian Philosophy a couple of days ago. And that will be um, coming out, I think, in July in print form. So um, it's quite text heavy. Um, it's uh, lots of reading of uh, passages this evening. Um, so if you're interested in looking at those passages uh, in more detail and at your own time, then please do look at this article, which has the full references and also the bibliography for a lot of the slides that I'm going to put up tonight. Um, so the, connect, the uh, link to that article is at the end of the slides. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, 
Um, is that working? Have I picked the right screen? Yes, yeah, it's working great. Okay. Um, I can't seem to maximise my slideshow, so sorry about um, the fact that it's not full screen, but I hope it's um, clear enough for you to read as I go through. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a term that we find in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, the term being Dharma Mega or cloud of Dharma. And uh, today's presentation is part of a much broader conversation um, and debate that is occurring in uh, studies of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as to how we really account for the um, number of Buddhist terms or the apparently Buddhist discourse that we find in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. And before I start, it's probably also just worth highlighting that I'm referring primarily this evening to the Patanjali Yoga Shastra um, as the Sutra and the Bhashya together combined. Um, and this is following um, the work of Philip Maas, which you can consult, um, Brief Historiography of Classical Yoga from 2013, in which he lays out some of the arguments for why this is a useful working hypothesis. Um, but it's also a discussion that's been around for a very long time. So already back in 1883, Rajendra Lalamitra noted that the name Vyasa, in his, in his translation of the Yoga Sutra, he noted that the name Vyasa rarely appears in the colophons of the manuscript. So Mitra referred to the combined Sutra Bhashya text as the Yoga Shastra. And uh, in 1930, Jacobi proposed that the Sutra and Bhashya comprise a unitary composition. And again, in 1985, in his article, Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras, Johannes Bronkhorst um, also fleshes out this idea. <clears throat> So the Patanjali Yoga Shastra concludes with a description of the pinnacle of yoga practice, a state of samadhi, concentration, called Dharma Mega, the cloud of Dharma. Yet despite the structural importance of Dharma Mega in the soteriology, or the system of liberation of Patanjali Yoga, the Shastra itself does not say much about this term. Where we do find Dharma Mega discussed at some length, however, However, is in Buddhist Yogacara and more broadly in early Mahayana soteriology. Here it represents the apex of attainment and the superlative statehood of a bodhisattva, one whose aim is to become an enlightened being. My argument today is that the apparent absence of other Brahmanical discussions of Dharma Mega in the early common era indicate that Patanjali appears to adopt this key metaphor from a Mahayana context. And as a metaphor, he appears to revise its primary meaning from fullness to emptiness or lack. So in a sense, today I'm trying to understand the broader context of Dharma Mega in systems of liberation in the early common era, and also trying to understand its technical significance um, and its conceptual significance, because this shapes how spiritual practices are constructed or designed to reach liberation. Within early Mahayana soteriology, the concept of Dharma Mega is especially elaborated in Yogacara and particularly in various sections of Asanga's Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. And when I refer to Yogacara today, meaning discipline of yoga, um, I'm primarily referring to early communities of ascetic practice in Buddhism in the first centuries of the common era, rather than to the more crystallized um, school of philosophy from around the middle of the first millennium. We have become accustomed to discussing just one yoga shastra in the classical period, that of Patanjali, but as I have argued elsewhere, the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra is also worth considering as another Shastra on yoga discipline from the same period. Since the earliest layers of the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra most likely predate the final reduction of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, it is reasonable to suggest that there may have been conceptual influence from Yogacara to Patanjali Yoga. So 
Today I'm going to work from the premise that the Patanjali Yoga Shastra postdates the early layers of the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra, which we can tend to tentatively trace back to around the second century of the Common Era. Um, and that Patanjali is therefore reworking uh, this Buddhist met metaphor of Tarma Mega. Um, reworking it from a basic meaning of um, fullness and abundance um, to a meaning that seems to indicate the very opposite, uh, i.e. lack. And I'm going to consider um, how this um, reworking can be argued to be um, part of a polemical attack, perhaps, on um, Buddhist Yogacara, uh, and also how the um, conceptual difference that we see in Patanjali's version of Tama Mega is very much um, compounded by the literary format of the sutra genre itself. Scholars of, um, oh, uh, I probably won't really dwell on these slides, but um, I suppose in the background of this piece of work is also this broader argument that we should consider the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra as a significant um, work on the discipline of yoga from the late fourth to early fifth century and before. And <clears throat> I have here a couple of instances from sections or books of the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra in which you can see that the work is clearly laying out definitions of yoga um, as here in the Shravaka Bhumi being comprised of faith, aspiration, vigor and means, um, or in the Pavanamai Bhumi, a later layer of the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra, a pathway of the cultivation of yoga, which as you can see moves through conditions, foundation, the cultivation, and then the result of the cultivation. Um, but this is an argument that I'm not really going to um, go into this evening. I have published an article in 2018, which is on academia.edu, that um, lays out some of these definitions uh, in the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra in a little more detail. So let's start with um, a brief analysis of Dharma Mega in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Scholars of classical yoga have long debated the meaning of the term Dharma Mega in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, and the detail of the debate has been focused on what Dharma means. So if you're interested in uh, Tracing the broad curve of this debate, you can look at work by De La Ville Poussin, by Gerald Larson, uh, by Klostermeyer, Rukmani, more, most recently by Dominic Guyastic, and others. One of the key reasons for the ongoing discussion is the polyvalence of the term Dharma. Moreover, Patanjali does not expound Dharma Mega's meaning in any detail in his text and we do not often encounter this term in Brahmanical sources. It should be added that neither do the sub-commentators, so the later uh, commentaries on the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, shed much light on Dharma Mega as a technical term. In combination, these factors point to Dharma Mega being an uncommon term in Brahmanism in the early common era, and I suggest that we may approach the um, meaning of this metaphor, dharma mega, in a more fruitful way by focusing not so much on dharma, which is of course crucial and which has shaped the discussion up to this point, but by focusing on cloud, on um, the significance and the denotation of this part of the compound. In the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, there are two brief discussions of dharma mega which appear at the beginning and the end of the text. So I'm reading the Sutra and the Bhashya together. And this positioning um, in itself is significant because it, it frames the text with this structural or conceptual bracket of Dharma Mega. The first discussion takes place within the quintessential definition of yoga. Uh, and the second discussion takes place in the concluding definition of liberation. In the first discussion, centred on Dharma Mega Dhyana, the meaning of Dharma appears to be virtuous or religious conduct. In the second discussion, 
centered on dharma mega samadhi, the primary meaning of dharma is liberating knowledge. So let's look at these passages in a little more detail. The first instance of dharma mega occurs in the definition of the absorption of dhyana, uh, the, the absorption of the cloud of dharma, and this appears in the commentary to the second sutra, the well-known Yogash Chittavritti Narodaha. Yoga is the cessation of mental fluctuation. And the discussion explains how the mind must be sequentially purified of any vestige of the three gunas, being tamas, rajas, and sattva. So when that very sattva is established in its own form, without the least me measure of rajas, being merely the cognition of the distinction between sattva and purusha, pure consciousness, it is conducive to dharma mega, dhyana. The passage describes the highest level of meditative attainment in which concentration is so restricted that it perceives just one thing, the difference between the sattva guna, the ontological state of balance, and purusha, the state of pure consciousness. Concentration can only access this stage by being devoid of any trace of rajas, tamas having long since been eliminated. And this restricted perception, or um, the state of absorption in which there is the restriction of the perception of the difference between uh, sattva and purusha, also represents the state of being established in one's own form, i.e. recognizing one's true nature as Purusha. So Dharma Mega Dhyana then is a meditative technique that generates the capacity to discern the ultimate ontological distinction between the principle of materiality and the principle of pure consciousness. In Patanjali's text, there is no explanation of the term dharma mega itself and what it means beyond its status as a label of a technique or a stage. However, in the preceding contrasting two descriptions of a chitta or a mind that is pierced by either tamas or rajas, dharma is mentioned twice. In the case of tamas, the four characteristics of the mind are, as you can see here, lack of dharma, false knowledge, attachment and weakness. In the case of rajas, the four characteristics are dharma, knowledge, detachment and strength. These two paradigms clearly mirror each other. And notably, dharma is the only one of the four characteristics carried forward into the description of a mind with sattva. In such a framework, dharma continues the semantic denotation of the prior two sentences and here means religious conduct or virtuous behavior. In this context, the connection to the cloud image indicates an exceptionally elevated, i.e. ideal, state of dharma. With regard to dharma then, chitta has three expressions which match the three gunas. Lack of dharma, which is tamas, presence of dharma, which is rajas, and exceptional dharma, or cloud of dharma, that surpasses convention or sattva. Patanjali's second reference to dharma mega occurs at the end of the Shastra, where it is discussed in more detail. This description is of the highest attainment of or dharma mega samadhi, the concentration of the cloud of dharma, and here we learn that dharma mega samadhi is equivalent to um, the samadhi that is without seed of samskara. So um, dharma mega arises from complete discriminating discernment um, and for one for whom the destruction of the seed of samskara um, has been destroyed or has occurred, uh, no other ideations arise. We have previously um, encountered uh, in the text this notion of the state of seedless concentration. And so Nirbija Samadhi was explained at the end of the first pada, which is Yoga Sutra 151 and its commentary. 
And so the equivalence in this passage on the slide would uh, appear to confirm that the Dharmamega Samadhi and Nirvija Samadhi are synonyms. So the cloud of Dharma is the seedless state. The Dharma Mega Samadhi is further characterized uh, as a state of infinite knowledge. So then for one who is free from the impurity of all obscuration due to infinite knowledge, that which is to be known is little. Here, all obscuration has been removed from the field of perception and infinite knowledge can be obtained. So, whereas in the opening discussion of Dharma Megatiana, we see Dharma being discussed in a paradigm that uh, contains knowledge, uh, but also virtues such as strength and detachment. Uh, but here, towards the end of the text, we see Dharma Mega Samadhi being framed primarily in terms of knowledge. So, I would argue that the description of the cloud of Dharma as infinite knowledge here supports the reading of Dharma in the fourth pada as um, closer to the meaning that we find often in Buddhist contexts of body of teaching or doctrine rather than religious conduct or virtue. So we're dealing here with uh, dharma being polyvalent, being polyvalent and having two to three primary meanings across different textual traditions. What else do we learn about Dharma Mega Samadhi at the end of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra? Well, we find out that it's also a state um, in which change and transformation are brought to a halt. Um, if, as we are told in Patanjali Yoga Shastra 1.1, yoga is samadhi, then the superlative state of yoga is Dharma Mega Samadhi, and it is a liberated state of cessation. From these two accounts of Dharma Mega in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, we can assert that Dharma Mega can be both ethical ontological, so that's the virtuous condition of Satyaguna, and epistemological, the condition of unlimited knowledge. Certainly, Dharma Mega Samadhi, we can say, is a superlative state of cessation and liberation. Okay, so. I want now to turn to some Buddhist sources to see if, um, if and how they can um, help us to make more sense of the conceptual and technical significance of Dharma Mega in Patanjali's text. In contrast to the relative dearth of instances of the term Dharma Mega in Brahmanical texts, we find an abundance of references in Buddhist literature. Starting with uh, some Pali sources, some of the earliest detailed discussions of Dhamma Mega in the Pali canon are to be found in the Apadana and the Buddha Vansa, both containing biographical stories about the Buddha. So for example, the Apadana states, uh, while the Dhamma Mega reigns, may all contamination cease, may people live according to their perfections, may they become stream enterers. So stream enterers here being the first of the four stages of the path of enlightenment, um, which eventually leads to um, freedom from the fetters and not being reborn. In the Buddha Vansa, the Buddha is described both uh, as being the, the agency of Dhamma Mega and as having a causative relationship to Dhamma Mega. So as the agency of the cloud, the Buddha rains the shower of um, Dhamma, as you can see from the quotation here, after he had attained self-wakening and was causing the world with the devas to cross over, he rained down from the cloud of Dhamma. So here the Buddha is identified with the cloud of Dhamma. In contrast, um, in this quotation, the Buddha has a causative relationship uh, or a causative relation to the reign of Dharma. And here we can see that uh, the cloud of Dhamma is separate from the Buddha. He makes the cloud of Dhamma reign. Beyond the Pali Canon, um, Dhamma Mega appears in relation to yoga in the first, second century Melinda Panha in which the Indo-Greek king uh, Mananda poses questions about Buddhism. The, here in this text, the example of Tama Mega 
appears in a long list of similes that are presented to explain the paradigm of right behavior for the earnest yogin. And using the structure of the simile, the text lists five qualities of the cloud that the yogin yogavachara is said to possess. And if you're interested, uh, Klostermeyer also discusses this passage in his article. The cloud is here understood to be a rain cloud and the five qualities of rain are settling, cooling, nurturing, protecting and creating abundance. And these qualities are all mapped to the ideal yogin. The passage explains that the cloud of dharma is a fruit of yogachara or yoga discipline. And its function uh, as a cloud is to provide sustenance and nourishment to the world. So this is a very long quotation. Um, I just have included the translation, but you can see here the structure um, of the comparison. So the rain cloud allays dust and dirt, so the yogin must allay the dust and dirt of the defilements. The rain cloud cools, so the yogin must cool the world by meditation of loving kindness and so forth. We go through this structure, the rain cloud makes all seeds grow, um, the rain cloud arising in due season. And then here at the end, um, we have the rain cloud in raining down fills rivers, reservoirs, lotus ponds, and gullies, crevices, lakes, water pools, and wells with showers of water. Um, and this is associated with uh, fecundity, abundance, the moment of awakening. So I think it's important to notice here that as we're going through, we see this expansion of the uh, importance of water within the significance and the meaning of the cloud. In comparison to the previous canonical examples, Dhamma Mega here is associated not with the Buddha, but with the agency of the earnest yogin, uh, who takes center stage in book seven of the uh, Questions of Ananda. And the rich detail provided by the simile is worth noting because um, in a simile, the process of uh, transferring qualities or domain mapping from one domain to another um, or from source to target, um, which are the technical terms in conceptual metaphor theory. In a simile, this process is much more explicit and much more evident than in a metaphor, which is a much more compressed linguistic and cognitive form. So later on, um, we'll be looking at some uh, metaphors uh, rather than similes. Uh, and I think it's just important to remember that in a metaphor, the qualities which are being um, mapped are not so explicit as in uh, the, the structure of a simile. I want to move on now to um, some of the early Sanskrit sources in the Mahayana um, canon, looking specifically at the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra and the Dashabhumika Sutra which is the sutra of the 10 stages. Despite the early context for Dharmamega in the Pali sources, the most well-known discussions of Dharmamega in Buddhist literature are in the early Mahayana sutras, particularly the Sadharma Vandarika Sutra and the Dashabhumata Sutra, both dated to the early centuries of the Common Era. The Lotus Sutra is often identified as the first sutra or Buddhist sutra text um, within the Mahayana corpus, proclaiming as it does the new vehicle. The text was produced in phases from perhaps the first century before the Common Era to the third century of the Common Era. And amongst the earliest layers of the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra are the verse sections in chapter five. This chapter contains extraordinarily detailed descriptions of the reign of true dharma. Uh, and although the compound dharma mega does not itself appear in this chapter, the sutra offers the first um, extended association of the Buddha with a rain cloud of dharma. Um, so we've looked at some uh, of the 
briefer uh, associations in the Pali Canon, we've looked at the questions of Menander in which those, associ those associations are made um, with the yogin, the earnest yogin. So this is the first extended elaboration of the Dharma Yoga in relation to the Buddha. Uh, and I'll just pull out some uh, phrases from this translation. Uh, the king of Dharma I am, the Dharma I teach to beings. It is like a great cloud which rises above the earth. And this great cloud filled with water, wreathed with lightning, resounds with thunder and refreshes all the creatures. The Buddha also arises in this world, just like a rain cloud. One of the features of this reign of dharma is that it nourishes all life equally. I refresh this entire world like a cloud which releases its rain evenly for all. And this assertion is fundamental to the new Mahayana doctrine of the Saddharma Pandarika Sutra. The text has to justify why the true teaching or the new vehicle has only been revealed now and not previously. And in order to do so, the text locates agency on the part of the disciples and not on the part of the Buddha himself. So the argument proceeds thus, even though the rain falls equally on all the seeds, some seeds turn into flowers, some into trees, it depends upon the capacity of the seed itself. Uh, so you can see here, each one according to their power um, takes to heart um, takes to heart this well-preached dharma. This indicates that the true dharma has been available all along, but that a lack in the capacity of the disciples resulted in the lack of yield. The image of this just reign of dharma provided by the Buddha is central to the text's strategies of validation for its new doctrine. Uh, and this is, so I'm, I'm showing some illustrations today from much later manuscripts uh, and from Japan and or Korea, uh, rather than South Asia, because these were the ones uh, that I could find that had some images of uh, clouds. The other key source in early Mahayana for the rain cloud of dharma um, is the Dashabhumika Sutra, so the Sutra of the Ten Stages. The text des describes the Ten Stages or Bhumis of attainment in the Bodhisattva path to liberation. And the tenth stage, the Bodhisattva Bhumi, is also called the Dharma Mega Bhumi stage of the cloud of dharma. And interestingly, um, although Dharma Mega is associated with the 10th level, at the second level, so the second of the Dasha Bhumis, we are told about the aim of yoga in this path system. Uh, so therefore, we should perform yoga, thus for total realization, uh, realization of the purification of all forms. That is how we should practice yoga. So in this text, unlike in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, we do not find, so we, we find Dharma Mega in compound, but not as Dharma Mega Dhyana, not as Dharma Mega Samadhi, but rather Dharma Mega Bhumi. Dharma Mega here represents the 10th perfection, Paramita, which is the perfection of knowledge. And this Bhumi, the 10th stage in the Bodhisattva path, is also called the Abhisheka Bhumi, which is the level of anointment or coronation. The Bodhisattva is like an ocean that can soak up the infinite amount of knowledge that rains down like a deluge from a rain cloud. And um, the Dasha Bhumika Sutra goes into great detail about uh, Dharma Mega and this rain of virtue. <clears throat> So um, the passage concludes, it is the bodhisattvas established in this bodhisattva stage called Dharma Mega, who bear, desire, get and possess all of this, which is the, this threefold, the revelation of great dharma, the light of great dharma and the cloud of great dharma. I want to turn now to some discussions of Dharma Mega in the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. 
So um, looking specifically at two sections or books of the Shastra that I have um, examined, but it's a, a really voluminous text. So this is just looking at a small portion of it. The term Dharma Mega is also discussed in um, the Bodhisattva Bhumi and in the Sandinamochana Sutra. So the Bodhisattva Bhumi, which is one of the oldest sections of the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, draws on the model that we just saw in the Dashabhumika Sutra. It says so explicitly. So I'm scrolling through these Sanskrit passages, but if you're interested in the Sanskrit, you can take a look at the article, but I'll focus on the translations for this talk. At the level of Dharma Mega Bhumi, in the Bodhisattva Bhumi, the Bodhisattva becomes omniscient like a cloud that produces rain to provide sustenance to the world. Uh, so we can see here, that Bodhisattva consists of a great cloud, that automatically contains the awakening by non-enlightenment and the awakening by enlightenment and causes to be settled the particles of dust of the glaciers of countless beings. Um, so here again we have that echo of the simile from the questions of Menanda. And in this text uh, at the, the Harma Mega Bhumi, the Bodhisattva enters into ever deeper meditation, acquires endless samadhis, limitless powers, and overcomes even the subtlest trace of the afflictions or kleshas. The cloud has a beneficial function in that it produces growth, pr proliferation, and propagation of virtue. As an aside, in structure, the Bodhisattva Bhumi is similar to another text that is generally attributed to Asanga, which is the Mahayana Sutra, Sutra Lankara Shastra, um, which also discusses the Dharma Mega, but probably in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into that um, right now. But you can again look at the article if you want to um, look up that reference. Um, and similarly, uh, I won't really get into this too much, but just to, to sort of briefly talk about the Sandhya Sutra, which is, um, it's an independent text, um, possibly dating back to the second century, but it's also um, embedded in the supplementary section of the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. And um, it too describes Dharma Nega, and I think for the purposes of trying to understand the Patanjali Yoga Shastra's scheme um, of liberation, uh, perhaps this text can provide some clues. Um, so the Sandhya Sutra, which we can translate as a sutra of the explanation of the mysteries or the profound secrets, its seventh or um, eighth chapter, depending on if you're looking at the um, Tibetan or Chinese, this chapter describes the ultimate form of yoga discipline, which is Buddhist yoga. The chapter contains the ten bhumis that we've been discussing in the Dashabhumika Sutra and in the Bodhisattva Bhumi. Uh, and as we would expect, the Dharma Mega is the tenth stage. However, um, it's not the final stage. This text also includes an eleventh bhumi beyond the tenth to represent the superlative state. Um, this 11th state is called the Tathagata Bhumi, the stage of realization of enlightenment. So as in the Dashabhumika Sutra and the Bodhisattva Bhumi, this text, the Sandhya Sutra's description of the Dharma Mega is a cloud of vast expansion, conveying a sense of infinitude. However, the Dharma Mega is now separated from the Bodhisattva Bhumi um, and replaces it as uh, which replaces it as the superlative state. So the new or the innovated 11th stage is a state of permanent cessation and the qualities mapped to this bhumi express negating functions, the elimination of the afflictions or glaciers, non-attachment and non-obstruction of realization. So from this observation one could speculate that Patanjali's Dharma Mega is echoing not the Dashabhumika Sutra, not the Bodhisattva Bhumi and those tenfold schemes, but rather 
a text like the Sunday Namotana Sutra, which combines the 10th and 11th level, levels of spiritual attainment into a single concept. Um, and seems to approach this idea of a dharma mega that is not generating all this abundance and growth, but rather produces cessation. Um, okay, so I have been um, hopefully building uh, a case for dharma mega as being a very prominent um, feature of Buddhist soteriology and discourse at the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century. The period in which we think that the final redaction of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra occurred. Functionally, Patanjali's Dharma Mega Samadhi closely resembles the Buddhist Dharma Mega Pumi as a superlative state. It is the goal of practice that provides endless knowledge and ultimate liberation. However, I want to argue that Patanjali strips back the metaphoric content of the Buddhist Dharma Mega the one that we've been talking about in most of the texts that I've reviewed, potentially strips back this metaphoric content so that the conceptual significance of the cloud in the Yoga Sutra is quite different. Whereas the Buddhist cloud of rain primarily represents cultivation of growth, Patanjali's cloud primarily represents cessation of growth. In mapping the qualities of a cloud, Mekha, to the abstract domain of spiritual liberation, Patanjali therefore selectively edits the qualities in order to revise the Buddhist Dharma Mega metaphor for polemical effect. As we saw in the previous slides, um, in the early Mahayana context, Dharma Mega was an elaborate metaphorical cluster to indicate vastness, abundance, a higher state, nectar from above, um, and primarily the stimulation of roots of virtue to sprout, grow, ripen, and so forth. And the image of the cloud is only effective in this context because it is interwoven with the image of water as rain or ocean. Notably, the flow of abundance is in two directions, from above, so from the cloud to the ocean or earth, and from below, from the ocean to the cloud. And this reflects the Bodhisattva emphasis on cascade teaching or sharing knowledge, in which the Bodhisattva receives the reign of knowledge from the Tathagatas and then in turn reigns knowledge to mortals. In the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, however, there is no such description of what the cloud of Dharma contains, uh, no image of a reign of abundance or an ocean of knowledge. It is as though the name Dharma Mega is co-opted from Buddhist sources, abstracted for its symbolic or functional value, and divested of its obvious metaphoric content. But perhaps it is the very sparseness of Patanjali's image that is itself most interesting, because it seems to contain a logical twist. Patanjali's inclusion of the term Dharma Mega, if indeed it is co-opted, may be an active critique of the other school of yoga, the rival Yogacara. Patanjali then not only divests Dharma Mega of its qualitative content, but also subverts its metaphoric logic or entailments, and hence its conceptual power, by imbuing Dharma Mega with the notion of lack rather than abundance. Far from expressing fecund growth by nurturing and cultivating the seed, Patanjali's Dharma Mega Samadhi is Nirbija Samadhi, the seedless state, the state in which all traces of the seed of future Klesha have been eradicated. Here, the cloud of Dharma presides over the negation of the seed, and the goal is to cut any growth by root and branch. So you can see the quotation on this slide from attaining that Dharma Mega, the afflictions of nations, etc are cut by root and branch and the karmic substrata, good and bad, are destroyed utterly. So hence, Patanjali's Dharma Mega um, metaphor is a rain cloud without any rain because it is geared not towards growth, but towards a theory of liberation that rests on cessation. The sensitive and negating functions of Patanjali's Dharma Mega are continued in the interpretations of the sub-commentaries 
but I'm not going to discuss those here. So from Shankara onwards, um, I briefly discuss those in the article. According to this line of analysis um, that I'm presenting here today, Patanjali's Dharmamega is a polemical revision of a core Mahayana metaphor. Patanjali grafts the signature Buddhist term, the Harmamuga, onto his own Sankhya inflected system. The significance of inverting the metaphoric value reflects that he is also inverting its soteriolo soteriological value. Patanjali takes the abundant, abundantly rain filled Harmamuga that symbolizes this social sharing or this cascade teaching in Buddhism and converts it to an empty dharmamega that symbolizes internal cessation. With its emphasis on teaching for the benefit of all beings, Buddhist dharmamega thus stands in stark contrast to the Sankhya ontological divorce from the material world. And given that the co-option of terms and concepts was common between uh, rival religious groups in the classical period, the argument that Patanjali's dharmamega was an intentional paralogical revision of metaphor is a strong one. So before I finish, I want to um, consider how this polemical revision is um, enhanced or reinforced by the literary format of the sutra genre itself. Patanjali's apparent inversion of the metaphoric value of the Dharmamega from, from abundance to lack may also be a product of literary form. Literary style itself not only affects the way metaphors are employed, but it can also amplify doctrinal difference. The richly evocative cosmological descriptions of Mahayana Buddhist treatises approximately co-evolved with the invention of writing, whereas Brahmanic Shastras are a more faithful transmission of oral culture. Tub and Booz described the sutra, the Brahmanical sutra format, as, quote, essentially signposts in a line of oral argument, unquote. So I suggest that since the descriptive structures of Mahayana Buddhist writing are more elaborate, they can more effectively exploit the literary potential of metaphors. In the textual culture of early Mahayana, literary style became more complex and innovative than that of oral texts. Indeed, the invention of writing may have partly provided the impetus and vehicle for doctrinal developments in Buddhism that led to Mahayana, and this is um, a contested point, I appreciate. The Mahayana writers displayed specific literary techniques to hone and express doctrinal concepts, for example, conveying eternity and infinity through language itself, or what a semi semiotician or linguistic scholar might call sy syntagmatic extension. As a result, the Buddhist accounts of Dharmamega Bhumi in the Dasha Bhumika Sutra and the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra are hyperbolic, so as to become almost unprocessable in the cognitive domain. The Mahayana literary style exaggerates the structure of metaphor, repeating and multiplying the qualities that are mapped in order to enhance meaning. So a basic doctrinal statement such as the Buddha is infinite or symbolizes infinity becomes, and this is um, a paraphrase of the style of the text that I've been looking at, um, becomes something like, the Buddha is immeasurably infinite, projected across the sky a million trillion times, in countless infinite directions, in myriad images of forms upon forms for all eternities upon eternities, with innumerable qualities, and so forth. So this literary style is not just about embellishment. It is the use of particular literary devices to formally express the doctrine of infinitude, the layering of these synonyms generates chains of words and signifiers that appear to be without end. So you don't just read the sutra text, the Buddhist sutra text, to extract a meaning, but the act of engaging and digesting the language, language renders the meaning, also renders the meaning. So the stylistic use of this synonymic saturation is the doctrine of infinitude in experiential form 
for the text consumer, whether you're reading, listening, or imagining, or meditating. The Mahayana literary style contrasts significantly with the style of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. The Brahmanical Sutra genre of compressed aphorisms belongs to oral textual culture and was designed for memorization. Hence, it is formally minimal. Patanjali's metaphor is only superlative and is not linked to any numbered levels or stages of attainment as in the Buddhist scheme. I propose that by virtue of a literary style that rests on compression, Patanjali's Dharmamega is super compressed and takes all 10 levels of the Dharmamega Bhumi scheme and, if you like, squashes them into one, a technique in which literary theory would be called synecdoche, where the part, so the Dharmamega, stands in for the whole, the whole scheme or 10 levels. The superlative stage in itself signifies the whole scheme of the 10 stages um, and therefore Dharma Mega stands in for the whole of spiritual cultivation as not just any part but the best part. And I think that for audiences in the living religio-philosophical communities in the fourth century that this context would have been explicit or obvious. Um, that Patanjali was in some way referring to the Dasha Bhumis, the 10 foundations or stages. But today as readers, we have to painstakingly unpick the densely compressed threads of meaning in Patanjali's work. So to conclude briefly, um, by categorizing the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra as a Yoga Shastra, I have put forward the necessity of considering that there were prior systems of non-Brahmanical yoga discipline to Patanjali yoga. And if Patanjali yoga postdates early yoga chara, um, if we accept that those early layers go back to the second century, the early layers of the yoga chara bhumi shastra, then this strengthens the argument that Patanjali is in some way knowingly referencing key yogacara paradigms or systems of liberation. So in my concluding assessment, Patanjali's strikingly empty metaphor of Dharma Mega, which, which really stands out as different in the whole discourse of Dharma Mega uh, of the fourth, fifth century. So Patanjali's um, different conceptual treatment is largely a result of um, not just polemical revision, due to doctrinal necessity. So he's co-opting it and he wants to make it fit with the Sankhya uh, soteriology, but also a result of literary style. Um, I will probably leave it there because I want to leave enough time for discussion. Um, I had a slightly longer conclusion, but I think that's probably enough for now. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Karen. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Great, excellent, excellent. I'm back on. Um, okay, we will. That that was actually extremely clear, very lucid uh, uh, presentation of a com fairly complex argument. Uh, I think we've got about well, ten minutes, let's say, for questions. We've got a, two or three on the Slido, but I'm going to use my chair's privilege to to uh, fire one, fire one off myself. Um, now I'm, you know, I haven't, I'm not, no great expert on the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, but I have translated a few bits and bits of it here and there, and I'm very aware that it's full of technical Buddhist terms. Um, you know, what one generally has to, there's a lot of words one has to look up in the Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit dictionary. So I'm wondering how what you, uh, what 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 you're proposing for Dharma Mega in terms of it being sort of used in a polemical way perhaps by Patanjali, how that matches the usage of other Buddhist terms within the text. Is that clear? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, well, I think the treatment of Buddhist terms is in some sense um, uneven uh, in that there is a lot of I mean, it's very difficult to prise apart the terms and to, to separate um, concepts or practices into a Buddhist camp and a, and a Brahmanical camp. 
Um, but I think there is something slightly different in um, the fourth pada, which is again a very old idea um, and one that's recently been discussed in, in very different ways by scholars like Michel Angot or Federico Squarcini. Um, you know, the idea that the, the sort of, there's a coherence to the first three padas um, that is perhaps not present in the fourth chapter of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which appears to take a more polemical stance towards Buddhist um, positions such as Chittamatra or the mind only position of the Yogacharas. Um, so I think it's uneven if we read the text as a whole, but there are definitely um, part, there are discussions of uh, Klesha, for example, where I think there is no, there is, we might say, um, co-option or, or kind of absorbing uh, of a key conceptual system of, of what an affliction is and how you get rid of it. But that's imported into the Patanjali Yoga Shastra from a text like the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya by Vasubandhu, and there isn't any polemical revision. So I think it's uneven. Um, and we come back to the idea that, um, I think Philip Maas states this quite clearly, that we tend to think of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as being authored by a single author, Patanjali, um, but perhaps um, the term editor or redactor is a, is a better description for the process um, of how the, how the Patanjali Yoga Shastra came together, because it seems to be quite synthetic. If you look closely, you can almost see that there are, there are different sections from different systems of thought that are being crafted together coherently with new material added. Okay, great. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, I, mean, I, I will bear it in mind as well next time I'm, uh, ha I'm translating or ha having a look at it. Um, now, let me see if I can work this slider. I think we've got a couple more, couple of questions, although they're popping up fast. Um, well, there's Ruth, uh, Ruth Westerby from SOAS, and I have a work out. I think, can Ruth, can you turn yourself off? Turn your camera on. Oh, yeah. shall I stop sharing? Would that be? Yeah, that might make things easier. Yeah, I can, okay. yes, if you could. Okay, this is kind of a silly question, but I want to ask it anyway because I do it all the time. I tend to describe Dharma Mega Samadhi if I'm talking to a general audience um, as, as the Matrix, uh, Keanu Reeves weaving through a pixelated version of the universe. So this would be to take a very ontological account of Dharma Mega. Um, and a very simplified one. And I'm wondering if I can still get away with that or I have to nuance it and how to do so to a general audience. And thank you for a really exciting talk. Um, well, you really got me there because I do use the matrix, but I use it for another class. I use it to, to describe um, Shankar as Maya. <laughs> so, um, so you've kind of got me there. So you, you, you describe the Harmamiga as the matrix. Could you say a bit more about yeah, coming from a coming from a Sarvastivada, everything exists type mm. of way. Um, yeah, so so you, yeah, in your talk you described it as you could take it in an ontological sense, or you could take it in more in a virtuous sense, um, in a teaching sense. So yeah, I definitely need to go away and refine the metaphor that I'm using for this. Mm. Well, I think you're right because I think if you if you think about it from the actual Sankhya ontology. It is a state of um, divorce, of separation, of isolation, um, residing in pure consciousness. But if you think about it from the, the primary um, way in which it's used in the Buddhist discourse, it quite often does mean this um, reign of teaching or body of knowledge. So I think that is the kind of mismatch that's happening in the fourth chapter in some senses, where I think you can see how the Haramig is being grafted on um, from a context where it primarily means body of teaching, but it's being used to describe an ontological state where um, there's nothing really going on in contrast to the Buddhist Dharma Mega, where Dharma Mega makes everything happen and grow and um, sprout. So I'm not sure. <laughs> But I think these these um I think these contemporary references are really important. Um, also to help you know to acknowledge that these are um, systems of philosophy that are relevant to our world and useful to us in understanding 
the meaning of life. <laughs> okay, thanks, Karen. Um, just a quick note, those of you, there's a, a cut, two or three people have put questions on the Slido, but anonymously, I, um, I can read them out, but if, you'd, <clears throat> if you want to ask the question yourself, put your name, then I can find you and unmute you. Uh, Alexander has asked a question. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Alexander. Do you want to ask it yourself directly? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Karen, just a question. So, um, uh, I understand from your presentation that the uh, introduction of the Buddhist term Dharma Mega uh, possibly is for polemical purposes. But is there any, any other reason why this uh, clearly Buddhist term is introduced while Patanjali already has a, a more Sankhya friendly term, Nirbija Samadhi? Well, I think it goes back to this um, question of what the purpose of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra is. So if the function of a shop Shastra is to um, collate existing knowledge and create a definitive coherent system, then um, it can be argued that that's what Patanjali is doing. And, you know, we haven't talked about Jaina soteriology as well, but clearly the Jain system is also being referenced and worked into the Patanjali text. Or um, you would have to perhaps look at the work of, um, as I mentioned, Michel Angot or Federico Sparcini, who have very different views on what the function of that fourth chapter is. Perhaps it was added later and it wasn't part of the original text and it had um, a different function to the rest of the text, which was to refute later debates that were happening between Buddhists um, and Sankhya philosophers, for example. Um, and then you could also look at the work of Gerald Larson, who um, reconstructs a, a hypothetical sequence of debates um, that happened between um, various members of the Sankhya camp on the one hand and the actually the Sarvastivada Abhidhamins on the other, including Vasubandhu's teacher. And so Larson suggests that perhaps the, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra comes out of this context of oral debate and polemical encounter, where there are these kind of battles being fought um, through, through the debates, which then are rendered into texts. So I think there are a number of different possibilities. Oh, I can't hear anybody. Sorry, Jim. No, it's me. It's me. It's me. I forgot to unmute myself. <clears throat> Thanks. We've got a, a question. Sort of the the, the only non-anonymous one left is from Walters Negrips, formerly of SOAS, now in, now in Oxford. So I'm going to unmute Walter. If you want to be un, unmuted, otherwise I can read it out, Walters. Let me know. Uh, uh, well, I've got my son now right next to me, so uh, I think he's making some noise. So can you just read it for me, please? Okay, sure. Now I've lost you, though. I can't see where to unmute you. Or so maybe you can mute yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, so Walters' question was, why must cessation be opposed to abundance? In early Buddhism, there is no opposition between the Buddha attaining cessation and discovering the Dharma. Yes. Um... I think you're quite right, and I didn't mean to suggest that cessation is not present within Buddhist soteriology, because it is, and particularly in Savastivada Abhidharma and in Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Koshabhashya. But I think in terms of the, um, the meanings that are being extrapolated uh, from the Dharmamega, in the um, literary descriptions, the primary meaning is abundance. Um, and it's just about noticing that this term Dharma Mega is appearing in so many texts in which it's part of a kind of unified discourse of growth and abundance. And that in this context, it seems odd that Patanjali's use of the text probably moving within the same circles at the same time, is contrary. But of course, uh, when we talk about 
cultivation, for example, or the paradigm of Pavana in Buddhism, it's as much about, uh, well, it's primarily about growth of um, cultivation of positive qualities, um, but you're absolutely right, cessation and um, growth or, um, you know, positive cultivation and uh, cultivation through elimination are very much part of the same process in practical terms yeah okay thanks Karen um, now we've got time for one or two more uh, it's an anonymous one but it's been bumped up so I should read it first what would be the practice for attaining such a state would it be sitting looking at the mind or listening to the teachings um, for attaining the state of Dhammamega in in Patanjali's text or in the I reckon. Buddhist corpus, um, I mean, in the Buddhist corpus, um, I think the schemes of practice are very complex in a text like the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. Um, there are so many different. Um, levels of detail within sort of broadly coherent paths. In the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, it would be sitting and um, in meditation and watching the mind um, until you attain the realization that the mind itself is part of the material realm, at which point there is that ontological separation from the mind and uh, Prakriti. Okay, thanks. Um, now we, there's a couple more, we might be able to squeeze them both in. The first, it's just been bumped up, so I'm going to read it first, is in Tibetan Buddhism, a popular metaphor for the mind is the clear sky. There, the clouds appear as impermanent phenomena. Is this image compatible with the Um Well, I can't comment on the Tibetan context because I really don't, um, I, I can't say much about the text, I don't read Tibetan. Um, it is interesting that you brought up the image of the clear sky because in terms of how the commentators after Patanjali, those who comment on the Yoga Sutra, um, in terms of how they um, continue to interpret and elaborate Dharmamega, it very much goes in that direction. Um, until we get to the point where Tama Mega is um, the, the sky that has cleared um, completely. So I've understood that to be um, in some ways a, a very logical continuation of the treatment that we see in um, Patanjali's text where the metaphor of, of the cloud itself is, is almost so devoid of qualities that it almost almost um, could be a, a dead metaphor or a commonplace metaphor where, as I suggested, it becomes a label that's almost extracted from its original meanings of monsoon-like rain. Um, so I don't know whether some of those commentaries perhaps also um, uh, shape the, the text that we see in Tibet. It's a good question. Yeah, good question. Okay, thanks. And finally, we've got one more. Um, how do you imagine these ideas were being shared on the ground at the time? Does this suggest that they were widespread? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, and that's still a big question for me. Um, one that I'd like to research more. Um, I think that um, Larson's and other scholars as well have made this point, but Larson lays it out really well, Gerald Larson, his point about debates being the generative source of all this interaction and that the texts are in some sense just a record of the debates that happened, um, that that would have been the key point of discussion and transmission of ideas. Um, and then we have, you know, the whole question coming up around well, what might have been the geographical sort of location for the production of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which is a really disputed point. We get, you know, all kinds of theories. Um, 
But there are some more um, restricted locations that have been identified, such as Kashmir, for example. Um, and I think there is cause to tie Patanjali's text if he's interacting very closely with the Savastivada Abhidharmins, with the Yogacharas, then we become interested in the areas that these groups are associated with, which include Kashmir, which include Gandhara, and perhaps also the Gangetic Plain. So in terms of the, the you asked about the, you know, the, the kind of breadth of the transmission or the reach, possibly we're talking about um, the whole north of the Indian subcontinent. But it's a big question. Good question. All right, thanks. Uh, right, we've got one more, uh, and it's from Vile. I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. Uh, Vile, if you want to ask it yourself, I've unmuted you. Yeah, I can. Thanks, Jim. Hi, Vile. Hey, hi. And thanks, Karen, for the excellent presentation. Once again, I just uh, maybe related to the previous question, that going on the ground beyond the text, there was this uh, passage you quoted that those words in Diana call it the Dharma Mega. And I was wondering who might those be in, in sectarian terms, or is it just a, like, like a rhetorical device Patanjali uses to, to introduce the term, or, or is he actually making reference to a certain community or communities? Mm -hmm. uh, or, and if it's a reference to a community, could it be a reference to the, 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 the Yogacara, to the Buddhist practitioners? And might there be a degree of recognition there, those words in Diana, it sounds like appreciative sense. Just, just like, I know it's very speculative, but just, just your, your thoughts on that. Um, I'm just finding that quotation because I think, it also mentions, is that the quotation where the Brahmins are mentioned? Um, uh, Patanjali. Perhaps I haven't got time to pull it up now, but um, in terms of the sectarian affiliation, again, this is where it's interesting to read the Bhashya along with the sutra, because the Bhashya in at least one instance, and Philip Mars has pointing this, pointed this out, mentions that the community being addressed are Brahmins. So those versed in um, uh, dhyana are potentially students within the Brahmanical tradition, or as you might be suggesting, perhaps in, a, in this context of debate, perhaps the opponents um, who may indeed be the Yogacharans or the Savastivadas or the Sautrantikas um, because it seems that the discourse is intertwined between all of those groups. I um, can't find the quotation now, but um, does that answer the question? question that, uh, yeah, it's a question difficult to, to answer and very speculative, but I was wondering, like, it's kind of an expression that those words in Diana, it, it, it might refer to a particular group of people in the meditative traditions, but also it's an expression that might be a bit broader. And mm. it, if it's a shared concept, it's, it's, a, it's a way of also like diluting the sectarian differences that, and referring to the meditative aesthetics in general, because also the, the concept of Diana is shared beyond the sectarian borders in, in, in the mm -hmm. place. So, uh, or m might it be a, actually a way of saying that I'm, I'm the Buddhist call this Dharma Mega, but avoiding the, 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 the term Buddhist or, or, or the Sarvastivadis or the Yogacharas or, or like, a, but it's just an interesting, interesting, uh, trying to figure out what the, what kind of actual communities of, of ascetics of, of, of people pursuing meditative absorptions and, and sharing the discussions. And I think it's a, you're doing very valuable work to, to somehow uh, draw these connecting lines between the, between the groups in the literary world, but then there's the real life. And that's a, that's a big question, what's happening there on the ground. It is, and I think, I know you work in um, Buddhist studies. I think the Buddhist treatises actually give a lot more sense of that material detail of the bodies and the subjects and the practitioners um, of the life in the monastery or um, there are quite interesting descriptions of yogacara ascetics in the forest and what they're dealing with 
you know, they're cold at night and there's spiders. And I find that really interesting because when you read a text like the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, I mean, there are these nominal references to a subject from, you know, a Brahmin audience, but, um, and perhaps somebody can challenge me on this, but I always feel like the material bodies of the practitioners is, it's not there in the picture. It's, you know, it's a very conceptual, theoretical formulation. So um, it's difficult to get a clear picture of the practitioners. And, um, and I think coming back to the point about sectarian aff uh, affiliation, again, I think um, going back to Jim's original question, it's not quite evenly um, formulated throughout the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. I think there are parts where um, it does feel very synthetic as if what the, the editor or the group of editors Patanjali is trying to do is to connect all, all of these systems into one perfectly formed and coherent uh, system of thought. But then in other places, and particularly in chapter four, um, there does seem to be this kind of host hostility towards some concepts within Buddhism. Okay, great. That's a good note on which to end. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. That was excellent, really fascinating. I hope, I hope, hope we can get you back sometime soon. Um, and I, now I think all it remains for me, well, I will say, obviously, keep an eye out on the on the uh, Facebook and Instagram and uh, for any future lectures. But before uh, I've said that, so now I think everyone, if they want, can unmute themselves and we can give Karen a round of applause.